Welcome to the Walsh College Creator Lab. Today, we are talking with another Unstoppable Achiever, and this one, I am so excited. This was actually a referral from a previous one. Mm-hmm. Terry Bean uh, told us, he's like, if you're going to get cool people in here, you got to start with Chris Lambert. So it was very fun to have wow. you uh, have you respond to us so quickly and get you in here. It's very exciting stuff. But Chris, I want you to talk about today some of your history, what you're up to, what you're going, and how people can get involved with you, because it's going to be, what you are doing is phenomenal work. Okay. So- Chris Lambert is the founder and CEO of Life Remodeled, and we're going to get into what that is, how it came to be, and kind of go from there. So Chris, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, and we'll dive right in. All right. Um, Chris Lambert, and I was born and raised in a very small town in northern Indiana. Okay. And when I say small town, I mean we didn't have a four-way stoplight until I was in middle school. Nice. (laughs) So the words urban neighborhood revitalization were three words I never heard in succession (laughs) as a child. (laughs) <laughs> and through a long, crazy journey, and I'm only 44 years of age right now, I ended up in Detroit. I'm married. My wife and I have two sons, and we love the work that we're doing in, 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 in the D. That's very, very cool. All right, so let's dive into what is Life Remodeled. All right, I always like to start with why first. Let's All do right, why. So That's even better. The reason why we exist is we're yeah. absolutely convinced Detroiters have all the talent they need. thousand percent agree. But- many don't have access to all the opportunities they deserve. And so when I talk about the opportunity gap for a minute, let's talk about the fact that right now, 88% of third grade students are currently reading below grade level. 30% of Detroiters cannot access the healthcare they need. And Detroit residents' median household income is half that of suburban peers. And so because of this disparity, what we do is we repurpose large vacant school buildings into one-stop hubs of opportunity for community thriving. Okay. And we fill these buildings with the best and brightest nonprofits that are delivering the services directly requested by community members. And we help everyone collaborate to really move the needle in dramatic ways that would have been impossible. That's before. that's incredible. Okay. Can you give me a couple examples of so people that are in these hubs of opportunity? Sure. Because that's phenomenal. Sure. So before I share those, it yeah. starts with first asking community members, what kinds of increased opportunities For do sure. you want more of? In For sure. Do you ever find, let me, let me ask yeah. you really quick. Yeah. Do you ever find that sometimes they don't know what they don't know? Um, I would imagine what I find is if questions aren't asked in a way that translates that you get a response, like, I don't know, but, um, that's part of the learning journey that I've been on for sure. At first I would just ask questions, well, what do you need? And and people may not necessarily respond to that with an immediate answer. And I learned that has a lot to do with how the questions asked. And so there's, there's very much an important, um, relationship development that must take place for authentic responses to be delivered to a question like that, right? And so after a lot of hard work and really developing trust and mm-hmm. and breaking bread together and learning from the community, um, there really are three things that we consistently hear in neighborhood after neighborhood in Detroit. Okay. And in no specific order, people say we want more youth programs that are educational. Love that. We want more workforce development initiatives that lead to sustainable livable wage jobs. And we want access to more and better health and wellness services. Okay. Okay. And then there's some nuances within those things. But so if we look at the Durfee Innovation Society, which is the first vacant school building that we repurposed. Okay. And that building has 34 nonprofits. Wow. It is 100% occupied. It's 143,000 square feet. And just for our viewers out there who aren't laying eyes on the building <laughs> right now, it looks like Harry Potter school. <laughs> it, 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 what was this school? It was uh, Hogwarts, Hogwarts, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it's got a slate roof, neo Gothic architecture, plaster crown molding. That's incredible. Right? The types of organizations that are in there are organizations that are doing one of those three things. Okay. So the largest workforce development initiative in Detroit is called Detroit at Work. That is in our building. I love it. Along with several other trades programs. Um, health and wellness services, everything from mental health services to cancer support groups. There's early childhood educational daycare that's a Head Start program ran by Focus Hope. There's 15 after-school youth programs. One of them is Beyond Basics. Another is Center for Success. Both of them do literacy. And then there's the Metro Detroit Youth Clubs, which used to be called the Boys and Girls Club of Macomb, Oakland County. And they were the number one performing Boys and Girls Club in the state. And they rebranded. And so there's a lot of great things happening there. That's incredible. Okay. I have to know how you got to this point. Mm. So 
as I'm reading through some of your background and those yeah. kind of things, it Crazy. sounds like there was something that happened during college mm. that shifted everything for you. Yes. So let's start prior to that. Okay. What was it like growing up? So you grew up in yeah. a very, very small town. It was very similar. Oh, we really? had we had a blinking light and that was it. That okay. was and so very I bet similar. You my small town was smaller than your small I, town. I bet it was. Okay, I we bet had it less was less than two thousand people. How many did you have? I think we had fourteen hundred. Okay. We had, right. we had we had a lot more cattle than we did people. Okay. And it was but it was an incredible way to grow up. Yep. Because you do get exposed to things in a very different way. But yes. when you leave there, mm. boy, is it a culture shock mm. because you realize that the world is so big. Yep. Now, for you growing up in that and yep. then coming to today, what okay. was that like? Because you don't just have a have a moment you go, I'm going to go change the world right mm -hmm. now yep. and do that. So how did you get to a point where, where you made that decision? Yeah, what I wanted coming out of high school mm -hmm. was I wanted to make a ton of money and fund the lifestyle that I thought that I wanted. <laughs> which meant, you know, however many cars and houses I wanted and travel all over the world and, and living in luxury, yeah. right? And I think I'm not alone in that a lot of no. people probably chase after that. Yeah. And I, I, was, I was dead set on that. And so, um, but what I wanted in college in particular was uh, great parties and all that comes along with that. And somehow I thought mm -hmm. I'd get it all together and get good enough grades <laughs> to continue that. Right. Okay. So I studied business, okay. which I, in many ways, am involved in business to this day. And sure. I would actually like to say that I think leading a nonprofit is actually more complicated than leading a, a similar sized company. Yeah. I'm not there's a lot more bootstrap General Motors up. Yeah. to life or model, but no. you know, no, you know but saying? there's, there's a lot of bootstrap stuff that has to happen in the nonprofit world. Yeah. You have to take a different approach to things big time. But I, but at this time I have no intention. No of leading a nonprofit or going down the direction my life took me. And uh, while I was studying business at Indiana University, I joined what at the time was the largest fraternity on campus. Okay. Um, a couple of years after I left, we got kicked off for uh, cocaine and guns <laughs> and all kinds of activities that made uh, the movie Animal House kind of look <laughs> like a Girl Scouts uh, <laughs> episode. But um, I was having a great time at that time in my life, mm -hmm. but there'd be these nights when I'd lay in bed and I'd kind of think to myself like, man, this isn't really doing for me what I thought it would do for me. Yeah. So my solution to my perceived problem was really just to double down on all those activities <laughs> that, that went along with that right. lifestyle. And then my junior year of college, I moved to Australia for six months to study yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. overseas. Yeah. Uh-huh. I know um, that move. <laughs> yeah. And my parents bought it anyway. But um, so it wasn't a lot of studying going on. But while I was there, I ended up experiencing what I would call this radical encounter with God. Okay. That completely changed the whole trajectory of my life. And it was the, the result of a number of scenarios that all culminated together. But um, one thing that was going on was I was traveling around in Southeast Asia, the Pacific Rim, and of course, Australia. Okay. And I began to realize the world is a very big place. It's a very big place. It does not revolve around me and my 22-year-old <laughs> ego, which was a very important lesson. Yes. Right? For sure. And then I met a couple guys over there who became my closest friends. And they happened to be what I would call Jesus followers. Okay. Okay. But they were pretty fun guys. They could go out to a bar, have some drinks and go home. Meanwhile, I'd stay out doing all the things they weren't doing. And they kept trying to get me to come to their church service. And I was like, bro, that ain't, that ain't <laughs> Um, And eventually I gave in and I went and it was okay. And I went back a second time and a third time. And the third time I went, I ended up having this just encounter where I heard God speaking to me for the first time in my life. And it wasn't an audible voice, mm -hmm. but it was more clear than anything I'd ever heard another human being say. The biggest change that came out of that was prior to that experience, you know, I loved my family. I loved my friends, right. but I didn't give a, a, a crap, let's just say, right. about anybody outside of my little bubble. Right. Right. I was paying no attention. Immediately after this experience and carrying on to this day, mm -hmm. I began to be very curious about other people, who they were, what was going on yeah. in their life, what their motivations were. Right. So I come back to IU for my senior year. Shortly before I left IU to go to Australia, there was not a single Jesus follower or Christian in this entire fraternity of 180 guys. Right. Before I got back, this had nothing to do with me. My three best friends in the frat also had these crazy encounters with God, <laughs> plus my drug dealer, who was an atheist <laughs> before I left. Right. And they look at me, they're like, Lambert, what the heck happened to you? And I go, what the heck happened to you? <laughs> I'll cut this story short, but we ended up starting this Bible study in the frat. Okay. And we started leading guy after guy to faith. 
after about a month, we had 12 to 15 guys come in every week. It was unbelievable. Yeah. And I was getting ready to go to law school and become a real estate developer. That, okay. was, that was how I was going to make all my money. Right. And now I'm not attracted to that at this point in my life at 22. And I'm starting to think, wow, maybe I just want to help people connect with God. And one thing led to another. I felt like that was the path God put me on. So I canceled law school, moved out to LA, studied at a seminary out there. Interesting. And a lot's happened since then. That's a very, it's a very different uh, world from where you started. Quite different. That's pretty incredible. So so you have this moment, you're 22, you said. Yes. So you have this moment, you you change everything. I mean, you you pulled quite literally a 180 on yep. life and yep. and everything came back. So yep. you went Australia, Southeast Asia, you're you're going all over the place. Yep. You quickly realize borders are arbitrary and it's mm. people are people and people mm. are fascinating. Yes. You come back and you now have a group of people that are kind of falling into the same steps that you are. Mm -hmm. You're finding into this space that has changed your perspective on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Take me well, now. Summarize. It's it, well, that's, that's I've tried. You got a gift there. <laughs> that's good. It's so, so you, you now take the step from that point. So now, now what? You move out, you move out West. Move out to LA, study and, seminary. And, and how does, how, where do you go from that point? Yeah. So, um, I thought at that point in my life, I was going to be a pastor, okay. church planter. That's what I felt like God was calling me to do. I met the woman who became my wife in LA, and we started to feel this very strong sense of calling to Detroit, Okay, which she didn't want to go. And so why I did, didn't want to go. Why Detroit? You know, um, as I look back on it now, here were the factors. My wife was born in Romania. Okay, She moved to Southwest Detroit when she was two because of persecution under communism. Yep. And again, she didn't want to move back. Mm -hmm. We both wanted to live in LA forever. But there were two clear factors that were very much in common where we both knew that we always wanted to live where these two things are present. Okay. And those two things were significant social need and racial diversity. Yep. And LA had that, right? But when we were looking at Detroit and the amount of investment at that time in 2004 okay. that was being made into uh, Los Angeles and the surrounding area and in Detroit, there was a much greater need. And so I think that played a big yeah. sense. And hey, there's more need here. And it, I don't know, we, we just felt like this is where we were supposed to be. Yeah. Well, an endless summer in California wasn't doing it for you. You had to have winter. Got to no. get that, <laughs> gotta no, get yeah, that you, you got that all wrong. <laughs> People say, I love the four seasons in Michigan. I say, you, you can keep them. I, yeah. I love the one season. <laughs> Here's the LA. one. One is good. It's <laughs> I love LA weather. I, I love surfing. I love crazy people. But um, Detroit has meant so much to us as a family, to me personally. And what we thought we came here for, we did. Mm -hmm. We ended up starting a church. Okay. And that was in 2007. Before we did that, we actually moved to Africa for, for nine months. That's a whole nother Yeah, that's story. a whole nother story. That's another podcast. <laughs> um, got kicked out of one country and had to leave with military assistance and uh, <laughs> our lives were in danger. But anyway, another episode. <laughs> so uh, here we are. We started this church and I thought I'm going to be a church pastor and planner mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. But it was actually in Africa that my perspective changed pretty radically where I realized, and again, this goes, I know this isn't a religious institution, but for me, this is a spiritual conversation. Um, I realized that Jesus spent the majority of his ministry with people who were the most marginalized and oppressed, and he was trying to get his followers to do the same. And so when we started this church, it was very much about how can we support people who are experiencing suffering, mm -hmm. life controlling circumstances, and so on and so forth. That was 2007. And then in 2010, I got this idea to start Life Remodeled. Okay. I thought I was just going to get it going and find somebody else to, to run, run it. it. Yeah. And meanwhile, there have been a, a series of entrepreneurial ventures I'd done in my life, but I still wasn't even cognizant that I was an entrepreneur until someone told me I was yeah. in 2017. Until you realized you were the textbook uh, entrepreneur. Yes. You were, yeah. I started a lawn mowing business in high school and eighth grade. I started a t-shirt business in college. Yeah. I, I didn't think those were right. real businesses, no. so I didn't know I was an entrepreneur. Yeah, no, well, and which makes sense because you wouldn't you wouldn't ever have that mindset unless you had somebody else in your life that was already doing that. Yes, and then you'd go, oh, well, I'm like that guy, and he's an entrepreneur, so I yes. must be because it's not it's not a phrase that gets tossed around much more today than it did then. Agreed. And now it's much more in the zeitgeist about you know, oh, it's an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur, starts many companies, all these things, which is wonderful, but it takes a very specific person mm. to do that. Yeah. And for you to then say, Detroit's going to be the spot, you fly in, drive in, yeah. you get into the city and 
and how do you even get started with something like right. like this? Because this is a massive undertaking. Yeah. Well, let's try to focus it on life or model because when we first got started, it was around the church right, concept. Right? right. And we just, I just. I, but if you look at life remodel, sure. that itself, how do you yeah. get the idea of go, okay, that's the neighborhood. I'm going after that one. Yep. I'm going to go over there and I'm not just going to make changes because that's, I think the part that a lot of people, they do is they go, well, I have all this money. I'm going to go make that change over there. Yeah, I used to think that way. Right. But then you make the changes, but if the community is not there, right. these things are meant not maintained. No, so well, you can go in and clean up the whole, the whole neighborhood. Yep. Great. This is, I'm going to mow that lawn. We're going to yep. board up some windows. But if the community is not on board, okay. you got to, you got to hire a group of people to go in and maintain that. Sure. So, how do you go in and, and make that first step towards your first neighborhood? Yeah. So um, three, three words that really define three different ways to engage in a neighborhood. Okay. Two, four, with. Okay. So doing neighborhood revitalization to a community is really gentrification. Yeah. This is when we're forcing things on a neighborhood that we think we know better. Right. Typically, when that kind of development's done, it's done merely for capitalistic gain. Right. Which means that only people who are of middle class or middle upper class or upper class can really benefit from that new housing or right. that new Whole Foods or, or whatnot. And it often leads to displacement of people who've experienced decades right. of injustice. Doing right. revitalization for a community is charity. It's where we come in and we say, oh, you're suffering so much and we're going to help you poor, poor people, right? Mm -hmm. And the truth is nobody likes to be treated like a charity case. No. And frankly, there was some time in my life where that's how I was operating and that's right. how our, our organization was operating. Okay. And eventually we learned the real key is doing the revitalization with the community. For sure. This is where it is multi-transformational where all of us are growing. And that actually is the essence of our name of our organization, Life Remodeled. Okay. None of us has got it all figured out. That's one of the things yeah. I've discovered because oh, yeah. I'm not even close and I haven't <laughs> met anybody who is, but I'm sure you're closer than I am. Yeah, right? I doubt that. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm on a lifelong journey. And um, I get just as much out of the learning experience in the work that we do in neighborhoods. And so I enter in with that posture. Mm -hmm. first and foremost, that I am here, we are here as learners. Now, that's why I go back to, you know, sometimes when we ask questions as outsiders of any culture that's mm -hmm. different than us, yeah, because we're not asking it in a way that people really feel uh, safe to be their authentic selves. yeah, And so they're not able to give you the answers that you're really looking for. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's out of ignorance on our part. Sometimes it's willful intent, whatever. So I, I've operated out of a lot of ignorance. I still have some. But my point is to go in, discover what does a community want and need, mm -hmm. and then do our skill sets align with their wants and needs? Okay. And if the answer is yes, we can come together and build something even greater. Yeah. Well, and, and when you get the community involvement, that has to multiply everything you're doing. It's everything because so we, what on on average what would you say your your volunteer count is when you start doing this stuff? So well, let me break down what we do. Okay, what we do because we you asked it earlier. Yeah, and I took too long to answer. <laughs> That's all right. We do three things. Yep. Right, we repurpose large vacant school buildings. We talked about that. Yep. Right. We have youth programming that's very much focused on education, leadership, access to opportunity. And then the third thing we do, which is what you're referring to, is our annual six-day project. Where okay. We mobilize 5,000 volunteers, and we beautify the surrounding area, mowing overgrown brush and weeds, right. getting rid of illegal dumping on vacant properties. Yeah. So that's so it's incredible. So now, you, you how many have you done now? And, neighborhoods? Yeah. How many neighborhoods have you done now? Um it takes me a minute to reflect on. So since we've been in Detroit, we have been in one, two, three, four, five, six neighborhoods. Wow. Yes. I mean, that's, that is, that's a massive amount of work a massive amount of labor and all, all for the betterment of the entire community. Mm -hmm. How much, how many, let's say percentage wise of that 5,000, how many would you say are coming, are volunteering straight out of the neighborhoods that you're actually in? Yeah. That's a lower percentage. Yeah. And I would say it's probably around 20%. Okay. And there's so many factors. To oh, that. I'm sure, yes, for sure. And so that's part of our learning process. And one of the things that we learned was, so you can go back on some of the blocks that we've cleaned up and they're going to look just as good as the day that that work was done. Mm -hmm. You're going to go back to others that look 
almost as bad as they did before we did. That, okay. Right. And here's, here's what I had to come to terms with myself. I live in Detroit. Okay. Right? I live in a great neighborhood on the West side of Detroit. If there was a vacant house next to me, which there's not, thank God. <laughs> um, I might mow it once a year. Right. There is no way I'm right. going to mow that thing every single week. Yep. Now, take that times if there's 10 vacant houses right. on my it's just, street. It's not possible. It's not my responsibility. Right. This city had 1.8 million people. We now have about 650,000. So it was part of the work that we were doing in blight removal that we realized this is helpful. It mm -hmm. is. We actually have crime statistics that have measurably dropped right after that work. But the real sustainable impact is in what we're doing in these vacant schools mm -hmm. by bringing these services and opportunities right. to the community. That's what leads to lifelong change. That's the thing that I find in so fascinating mm -hmm. is that you have taken it, you've taken it from, like you said, from being this, this charity thing of like, oh, you poor people, I'm going to help you. Mm -hmm. But now you're going, let's, let's help you help you. Yep. Let's get you the skills you need to make not only yourself better, but yep. your future, your future children, your children, your children's children. I mean, you're setting up a, a longevity of, of greatness that nobody's ever given that time to. So when you go in, a lot of people would, would look at that and go, okay, well, what's in it for you? But you don't appear to be the person that's in it for you. So what is driving that next thing? What is it that makes you so excited? What makes you get out of bed in the morning and go do the next neighborhood? Well, I do want to back up because I want to say there are a lot of people in the neighborhoods that we work in that are putting in sweat equity oh, every for day. Sure. And they are doing something, right? Yeah. But let me say what I said earlier a little bit differently. I talked about Detroiters have all the talent they need. Mm -hmm. You might have heard of this statement that talent is evenly distributed all over the world. Okay. But opportunity is not. Very much not. Okay. So I came from a land of opportunity, even though it was a small little town. I have a two parent home. My parents invested a lot in me. Right. I was able to go to the college I wanted to go to. And, and that was paid for by my family. Right. I've had a lot of people surround me. There's a lot of privilege that comes along with my life circumstances. Right. right? And so I feel that to the responsibility that I've been given is significant because of the opportunities that I've been given. Right. And so I don't feel like people aren't doing anything, but I feel like that many, many of the individuals in these neighborhoods haven't been given the opportunities that I've been given. So they're not able to access millions of dollars of capital for sure, or, or political will or thousands of volunteers. And so I, I consider it a duty, but not something that I dread. I mean, I love what I do and I'm I do sure what I love. Do. Um, you must, you keep doing it. So you must be loving it. And, and, and I, and I really believe it has everything to do with eventually learning how to do this with the community because right. for a while, you know, it, it did feel a little, a little awkward when it was just I'm charity. Sure. It was transactional. Yeah. Right? But, um, I think it all just comes down to everybody's on this earth for different reasons. Yeah. Right. And we got to discover why we're here and, and live into it. And so yeah. I've, I found uh, my niche and I've realized that it is all about teams, the team in the community, the team in your organization. We have a lot of fun with our amazing team of mm. talented people who are smarter and better than I am at a whole lot of other things <laughs> where I'm able to stay focused on what I do best right. and, and keep going because it's not easy out there. That's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Chris, I... Uh, your story, the first time I heard it, yeah. was the most inspiring thing. And, and it immediately made you want to go and just do better. Like yeah. it just every day, do something better and help more people. Wow. And thank you. I, I you. appreciate so much that you're not only willing to do this, but you're willing to go out and tell the story of, of how this came to be Yeah, because you're not guarded by the fact that your past is, is very different than what today is. Sure. And for people to be able to look at you and that may be that version of your old self and going, you know what? I can do this next thing. Yeah. That is an incredible piece of this. We, we launched this whole series about unstoppable achievers. Okay. It is something that we believe very strongly in our students and our alumni. We have, yeah. a, we have them coming out of the woodwork that fall into this unstoppable achiever. What we enjoy doing is bringing people like yourself in who may not have been involved with Walsh before. Sure. But have this story of like, look, you can do this. This is a possibility for anybody. Mm. And for you to, whether it be through a religious piece of it or just mm. you come across somebody that changes the thoughts. Mm. And 
you seem to be that person that's going to change people to be better people. Mm. And I appreciate you telling that story. Okay. With that, yeah. I know that there is people listening that are like, I want to go do that. Okay. How do people get involved with what with what you are doing, with what Life Remodeled is doing? How do they get involved and what can they do once they get involved? Okay. So whenever anybody asks me that point blank, if we're having a one-on-one conversation, I always want to turn the question around and find out what do you like to do? What motivates okay. you? So on and so forth. But I know we're talking to a broad audience <laughs> yeah. here, right? So um, the six day project, which you're very knowledgeable yeah. of, happens every year. This year it's September 23rd through the 28th. Okay. And you can volunteer from 12 to 5. We provide all the tools, the lawnmowers, the weed whackers, okay. all that good stuff, right? You just show up. Although I think four of the six days are actually fully booked. That's incredible. It's that's a good a, problem to but have. That's a great problem to yes. have. That's incredible. But there still are some opportunities. I yeah, want to yeah. say on Monday and Tuesday, which is like the 23rd and 24th. So you can just sign up on our website, okay. liferemodeled.org. Org. And okay. then click on six day project. Love it. And then for those who are more interested in being involved in a year round basis mm-hmm. or potentially working with youth, there's other opportunities like that listed okay. on our website. Okay. Um, and that's why it's so important to find out what is a person's passion? Yeah. Are, are they looking for an internship? Are they looking right. for a one-time volunteer experience? Do they want to read to a child or read with a child? Right. You know, once a month, um, there, there's opportunities so to link you up. Yeah. With. So there's everything from, from being that, that hands-on weed whipping, mowing yeah. all the way down to let's just read with a kid. Yes. Cause a lot of times that's what they need. Yes. They just need somebody there. That's going to show them the next thing. Game changer. Oh, I, I absolutely cannot. I cannot imagine the emotional roller coaster you must go through in, in your role. And so Chris, I, I love this. I love the entire story. Your background is incredible. And, uh, and I hope that through this, we can get some people in touch with your organization and get people involved. Sounds like a plan. Chris, thank you so much. Thank you. I really, really appreciate it. All right, bro. Thank you. Appreciate you. Yeah.